Hello, welcome to the Operating Department Practice Talk at today's Digital Open Day at the University of Leicester. It's good to see you. My name is Kevin Harrop. I'm the head of ODP education here at the university. I am a registered ODP myself. And during the session, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and I will answer those after the presentation. So I want to say a little bit to start with about the School of Healthcare. So the School of Healthcare was established here at the university in 2019. And in the School of Healthcare, we run a number of groundbreaking courses in midwifery, nursing, ODP, physiotherapy, and for the first time in 2023, diagnostic radiography. ODP has been at the university for quite a number of years, and we transferred to the medical school, from the medical school, sorry, when the School of Healthcare opened in 2019. That's a quick list of the courses that are run within the School of Healthcare. But I'm here tonight to talk about the Operating Department Practice BSc. My job is to give you information to help you make that choice whether to list Leicester as one of the universities that you would like to come to to study operating department practice. So I want to start just by trying to answer this quick question for you. Why study ODP here at Leicester? Well, here at Leicester, we've been a specialist provider of ODP education for over 40 years. ODP education has evolved. Leicester has always been one of the pro providers at the forefront of the national provision of training for operating department practitioners. Because of that, we've built well established clinical partnerships with the hospitals that we work with. And that's a real bonus when it comes to the quality of clinical experiences and clinical assessment that the students have. Here in Leicester, we have a friendly group size. Most of our groups have between 30 and 45 students in them. One of the reasons for that is that we actually here have two intakes of students a year. We have an intake in the spring and we have an intake in the autumn. That is quite important because if you think about it, we are providing qualified ODPs for the NHS. And the NHS don't just need ODPs in the traditional university end of term, they actually need ODPs all year round. So that makes our course fairly popular with the hospitals that we work with. And those two intakes a year is what helps us keep our group size down to between 30 and 45 students. So that means that students get to know each other well. Students get to know us in the academic team well. And importantly for us, we get to know students well and we can build those real relationships right from the start of the course that we are on that journey, your journey, from the moment you start to the moment that you qualify and graduate from our programme. We do also run here the degree apprenticeship programme. I'm not going to say a lot about that in this presentation, um, but if you want more information about the degree apprenticeship, do feel free to contact us. We work in high quality educational facilities here at Leicester. We're based in the George Davis Centre that actually has only been open for a period of five to six years. So it's a modern, well-equipped educational building. We are as a programme approved by the Health and Care Professions Council. Now that's taken as a red. All courses have to be approved by HCPC. And here we are also validated by the College of Operating Department Practitioners. 
Now, we are one of the top providers of ODP in the UK. There are only about 25 universities that deliver operating department practice. And in the National Student Survey, we have consistently been in the top five. Now, in 2022, we achieved an overall satisfaction rating of 75%. Now I'm quite pleased because on paper that looks good, but I'm actually quite disappointed because in previous years, our satisfaction rating has been in the 90%. There is a very simple reason for the drop, and that simple reason is the COVID pandemic, which drastically changed education for our students that completed the National Student Survey this year. So let me say a little bit more about our style of learning. So in ODP education, we offer you a variety of teaching styles and a variety of different inputs. Now that's really important because not every teaching style, not every type of input suits every student. I'll often say to people what we don't do is lecture. Let me quickly define what I believe a lecture is. A lecture is often students sitting in a tiered lecture theatre, listening to um, an expert talk about their favourite topic for 45 minutes to an hour with not necessarily a great amount of interaction. So we do do lessons that we lead from the front of the room. We do group work. We do some practical teaching. We, we do some quiz based sessions, some debate based sessions. But everything we do is around interaction. Even when teaching a lesson from the front of the room, we're interacting with the students. We're asking questions. We're answering questions that the students might ask us. So it, it, it's a very informal, in a way, um, style of learning, and we find that our students enjoy that. Now, we also support that variety of teaching styles and teaching input with a mixture of assessment methods. We do use traditional assessment, so, so we have end of year exams, we ask students to write assignments or essays, but on top of that, we do case studies. We do a number of group work presentations. Um, students in one of the presentations that we do, they prepare a poster or a leaflet. They then present that to what I refer to as a Dragon's Den style panel. So that mixture of assessment methods there is something that suits you. Hopefully there's more than one method that suits you, but it, it allows students to excel in the assessment methods that, that they are more comfortable with. Of course, being a clinical based programme, there is a lot of authentic clinical assessment, and I'll say a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Um, to support that clinical assessment, our students use an electronic portfolio, which gives them the opportunity at any time to um, upload information to their portfolio, and we can see that live. So let me say a little bit about our staff. We, we are a team of, of, of nine academic staff. All of us are ODPs, we're registered as ODPs, and that is really important because we understand that unique environment of operating theatres. We're experts in our field. Between us, we have well over 100 years of experience as ODPs. Our students will sometimes say to me when I quote that, well, you have 100 yourself, Kevin. Actually, we're not, not quite true. <laughs> But that wealth of experience working in hospitals across the country 
we bring our experiences together and we understand that environment. When students are out there in clinical placement, they are supported by leader mentors or lead practice educators that again are people that are working in theatre. We do of course network with national bodies. We, we network with the Health and Care Professions Council. Earlier this week, two of our staff were at a national meeting of the College of Operating Department Practitioners. So we network with those really important national bodies. I'm not going to say too much about our course and, and the structure of our course, but there are one or two things here that are really important. And some of these things are things that make Leicester different in the way we offer our programme. So what is fairly common across the country is that all of the ODP BSc programmes are three years. They're a three year BSc programme. Here in Leicester, our students spend 65% of their time out there in clinical placement. The rest of the time is spent here at the University of Leicester. Our students complete five compulsory modules each year, so there's no need to worry about choosing modules, which do I choose, because often in that environment, students want to choose more than one. If you look on the right hand side of this slide, you can see that year one is foundation skills, year two is developing those skills, year three is enhancing those skills. And of course that journey then moves for, through to graduation, qualification, and the ability to register with the Health and Care Professions Council. Now here at Leicester, we operate our programme over 48 weeks of the year. So we're not working semesters. Now the rationale for that is in listening to students, in talking to the staff that we work with in the hospitals, there are two things that make a good ODP. There's actually a lot more than that, but there are two important things that make a good ODP, and that is confidence and competence. So that long programme without those big long summer breaks, without those periods in which your confidence and confidence drop, produces a better quality graduate at the end of the day. We split our timetable into study block weeks and clinical placement weeks. So that means on the study block weeks, you focus on your academic work here at the university, on your clinical placement weeks, you focus on what you're achieving in clinical placement without that being interrupted by, for example, having to come to university one day of that week. You see there that in study block weeks, you spend 26 hours learning and in placement weeks, you spend 30 hours on placement. Our students tell us that it's hard work. I, I don't want to pretend it isn't, but they do say both before they graduate and after they graduate, that they have reached that level of competence and confidence that allows them to go out there and be a, a very good um, member of the operating theatre team as an ODP. There's a quick list. I'm, I'm not going to talk through it, but that's a quick list of the academic topics that we cover on the programme. There's nothing there that you wouldn't expect to see on a programme for people that are going to work with patients in theatre. I do want to say a little bit more about clinical placements because this is an aspect of, of your thinking or in, in why go to Leicester that is really important. So we use a variety of clinical experiences. So as a student, you get experience in a lot of different specialities. Um, basic specialities in year one, in year two, students may move into more specialist areas of practice, things like ear, nose and throat surgery, plastic surgery, paediatrics, the, the, the list is long. We use those consistent periods of placement. So in some of the modules, students are in clinical placement for periods of, of between eight and 12 weeks. 
so you get that consistent experience. But what is really important is that we might be the University of Leicester. We might be one of the top providers of ODP education in the country, but we don't just work in Leicester. So we work across the East Midlands. So our students are based at hospitals in Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, Lincolnshire, Northamptonshire, um, and, and there's a whole lot of hospitals that we work with. Now, because our students are based in clinical placement for 65% of the time, we do recommend that students live near their placement. And that might be that you already live in one of those geographical areas, or it might mean that you relocate to one of those geographical areas. Therefore, what we do here is if you apply, if you are successful, we clearly make you an offer. And at that point of offer, we inform you which hospital is going to be your placement hospital. And that then is your placement hospital for the whole of the three years. Yeah. So that gives you the ability then to think about that relocation. We do at the time of interview, ask students where they would like to be based. We can't always give people their first choice hospital. And the reason is that each hospital has a limited number of placements available. And if we go over that number of placements, all that results in is poor quality placement. So quality of placement is what's important in relationship to the way that we work. When students are on study block, they can have study block accommodation, which is provided in the university accommodation block um, at a um, reduced price to what it would normally be. One of the really important things about clinical placement is that our students are fully embedded in theatre teams. They're not there watching. They, they're, they're learning the skills, performing the skills and being assessed. So they're working with real patients. They're getting real ODP experience and that is preparing them for qualification. I've already mentioned earlier about the live assessment, the, the, the authentic assessment, and that is matched by authentic feedback. So if you're being assessed by a mentor, that mentor will watch you, they will talk to you and they will give you instant feedback. Yeah, so there's no, with, with that live clinical assessment, you don't have to wait for them to write up a report there and then they will say you did really well. Actually, you did all right. These are the areas you need to develop. In. And that bit live feedback is really important. Now, the other thing I want to talk about for a minute is, is the way that we support you. So the University of Leicester has a really good reputation for student support. In our department, in ODP education, we very firmly believe that academic support, so that's with your studies, pastoral support, that's about things that happen in life and clinical support, so support with your clinical placements, can't be separated. So we provide all of that level of support initially at departmental level through all of the staff, including myself as head of ODP. We're all there to support the students on their journey. My note there says that, that, that we have personal tutors with real planned tutorial time in each module. So that means that in each module, students will meet with their personal tutor in a planned meeting at least twice. It's not left to you to book when you feel you need to meet your personal tutor because a lot of students don't recognise that. So we, we formally arrange those meetings in advance. And then beyond that, we refer students to other university support services as and when necessary. Let me say a little bit about employability. Um, we have a 100% employment record at the end of the programme. I would love to say 
that that is unique to our program here, but actually that's true for all ODP programs and for most healthcare programs, it's no secret that the NHS is crying out for staff. So there are plenty of vacancies for ODPs in theatre when you reach the point of graduation and qualification. As, a, as an ODP, you are of course registered with the Health and Care Professions Council and you're free to apply for jobs that might be in the NHS or they might be in the independent health sector. And as you, as you will be aware, independent health sectors and the NHS are working a lot more closely together in, in the modern delivery of healthcare. There is also a well-developed career ladder for ODPs. Um, there hadn't used to be, if we go back 15 years, there wasn't a well-developed career ladder for ODPs, but now there is. And that's something that, 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 that we, we make sure that as part of the process of your application, um, we do talk to you about. So I want to talk fairly briefly about the ODP role, because the ODP role is sometimes referred to as the best kept secret within the NHS. Now, one of the key reasons for that is, of course, the majority of patients, when they are in the care of the ODP, are anaesthetised, they are asleep, they don't see what the ODP is doing. So the ODP works in three key roles. There's the anaesthetic role, and that's working alongside the anaesthetist in ensuring that the patient is, is anaesthetised safely and looked after throughout that surgical procedure. With that, there's a very technical part of the role. There's a lot of working with equipment. There's a lot of caring for the patient. The second part of the role is working in surgery. So that's either scrub up, working directly with the surgeon, or as what's called a circulating practitioner in theatre, where they're doing all the other bits and pieces that need doing. And then the final part of the ODP role is working with the patient when they wake up following their surgery. And that's a time when patients, again, need a lot of care, a, a lot of, of looking after. And so the ODP is that constant person in theatre throughout the whole journey of that patient. I'm an ODP, I've told you that already, therefore I'm biased. But it's the best job in the NHS. It gives that nice mixture of caring and technical work. It is also a job that involves working very closely with other professions, and that is rewarding. You meet some you know, fantastic surgeons and anaesthetists. We work closely with all the support staff in theatre. And, and it's a real close working environment with the challenges that come with that. And that's why the fact that we all understand that environment helps us support our students. So the ODP is without doubt an essential member of the operating department team, yet not heard of very often. Um, there's a little bit then about those those career opportunities. So on the course, you get a wide variety of clinical experience. You work in, in routine elective surgery and emergency surgery, and you work in some of the high ranked NHS organisations that exist across the East Midlands. There is a well developed career ladder. Um, you can move into leadership. You can move into education like I have. You can specialise in specific areas of theatre work. There are a number of advanced roles that ODPs can move into. Surgical first assistant, surgical care practitioner or physician's assistant. They're new developing roles in the NHS. But what is really important for people to understand, you cannot then become a doctor. Yeah, people will often say to me, if I become an ODP first, can I then become a surgeon? Or if I become an ODP first, can I then become an anaesthetist? The answer is no. 
OK, so so anaesthetists and surgeons have to do medicine first before they can practice their chosen area. So a little bit about applying for Leicester. I'm not going to say too much about this because it's all on our website. So there's all the details there about the, the, the entry points. What I do want to talk a little bit about, though, is what I call the softer entry criteria. So we're looking for people who have good people skills, who have the ability to care, who understand what the NHS is all about. We're definitely looking for people who want to work in theatres, they can adapt to the theatre environment. They need to have good communication skills, professional abilities, professional attributes, and also be reliable and hardworking. Now, I don't want you to think, looking at that list, that that means that applicants have to have worked in hospitals before. They don't. A lot of our students haven't. But those range of skills need to be, if you like, within your makeup, within your personality, something that we can tease out of you and develop over the three years. On the previous slide, you might have noticed down here, we do multi mini interviews as part of our selection process um, and we engage with, uh, with our offer holders um, once you've been given an offer. So our typical applicants come from a wide variety of backgrounds, school and college leavers, mature applicants, people that I call career changers and healthcare progressors. So why Leicester? Well, I'm not very good at maths, but here's a bit of maths. Expert staff, expert led clinical placements equals expert students and expert ODPs of the future. If you want to get in touch with us after this, this presentation, do feel free to email ODP education at le.ac.uk. Now, a great friend of the University of Leicester, um, you recognise that gentleman, say, says become what the world needs. So what does the world need? It needs perioperative care experts people that are experts in the care of patients along their journey. And that's ODPs, experts in anaesthetics, in surgery and recovery and beyond. So I hope that what I've achieved today is to give you the information that will help you decide, firstly, is ODP something you want to pursue? And secondly, if it is, do you want to pursue ODP at the University of Leicester? Now you've heard what I've said to you. All the very best. Thank you for joining us today. And if you're listening to this at a later date, thank you for listening. Now, I, I don't know whether there are any questions coming while I've been talking, but if there is, then I'm happy to ask them. Thank you for listening. Hi, Kevin. Yes, we have a few questions. OK, so thank you for that talk. It was really informative, lots of detail. But we have just um, a couple of questions if you're OK to help us. Absolutely, with them. I, I will do my best to answer. Them. <laughs> OK, first is how do you choose uh, between the spring or the is it September start? Yeah, OK, yeah, so. Um, at the point of application um, through UCAS, students are asked which um, which intake they would like to apply for. And their application is processed for that intake. If we're finding later in the process that the intake that that student has applied for is becoming full because we only have a limited number of places, then what we what we will do is talk to that applicant about whether they want to transfer their application to the next available entry, which usually is six months later 
because we do the two intakes rather than in most providers 12 months later. Yeah, so it does give people that opportunity twice. I think it's fair to say that the intakes are very slightly different in in the the, the nature of person that applies. So the September September intake is, if you like, the traditional university intake. So for the September intake, we, we get a greater number of sixth form college leavers, A level applicants. For the April intake, we get a, a, a slightly higher number of people that might be doing it as a second career or, or have worked in the NHS. So, so a slightly more mature group, but all the groups are mixed with young people, slightly older people, sometimes very mature people. Um, so we, we, we talk to the applicant about what they would prefer. OK, now we have not finished recruiting for the April 2023 intake. So if anybody wants to apply for that, they, they can specify that when they complete their UCAS application. I hope that answers that question. Thank you. So the next question is, who do I contact for information about the degree apprenticeship? Is there an email or a phone number? Right, OK, so what, what I would do is I would email us at odpeducation at le.ac.uk. One of the things that that is significantly different about applying for the apprenticeship route is you don't apply through UCAS and you don't actually apply to the university. You actually apply to an employer. Yeah, so we work with at the moment two hospitals that's soon to be expanded to about six hospitals that work with us for the apprenticeship programme. So the applicants for that programme apply to those hospitals because those hospitals become their employer and then we are involved in the selection process. Apart from that, our apprenticeship learners, our apprenticeship students do exactly the same as the other students because the programme we run, we know produces confident and competent ODPs. So it is really a different routine. People will know that there are differences in, in, in the way fees are paid and, and all of that, but it's essentially a different routine to the same high quality programme. Um, but we can give more information if you email that, that email at ODP Education. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the next question we have is if students need to travel to their placement, is there a financial contribution for students that need to do right. so? Or is there um, maybe an extra right. thing okay. loan or something like that? Right, right. So, so, so that's a really good question. So firstly, we do recommend that students live close to their placement hospital because things like you probably have to be there at half past seven in the morning. Yeah, because that's when the operating lists start to be prepared for. You, you probably have to be there till six in the evening. So traveling from Leicester, let's say to to Northampton or Leicester to to, to Nottingham, even Chesterfield can be quite difficult on a daily basis. OK, um, so that sort of answers the question. But what all ODP students that are not on the apprenticeship scheme get is they get an NHS um, bursary. And that's a payment. You, you do have to meet eligible eligibility criteria, but the vast majority, 90, probably 98 percent of students meet the eligible eligibility criteria. And that's a, an additional income on top of the student loan of five thousand pound a year yeah um and then within that there are other things that you can claim for other expenses that you can claim for in addition to that five thousand okay 
Um, if you are successful in being selected for interview, we do give you the information on how that bursary works. And that's nice. That's a bit of an incentive. It does apply to all healthcare students, not, not just ODP, but, but that is a nice incentive. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Um, so uh, tying into that, what are the interviews like and where are they? Are they in Leicester? Right, yes, the interviews are held at the university. We we invite you in for um, a whole day. There is information available, there are refreshments available. And the way a multi mini interview works is that you move around a number of interview stations and you spend a period of no more than 10 minutes in each interview station. And in those interview stations, you are asked to talk about things, demonstrate things that you can do, answer questions. One of the big advantages of interviewing like that is if you get a single interview, a traditional interview, so you're sitting one side of the table, there's a panel of four or five people sitting the other side of the table. Um, if you mess that up, you've messed it up, yeah? With multi mini interviews, if you go into one of the stations and you come out feeling, oh, I didn't quite do my best in there, you've then got another series of stations to do better, yeah? And it also allows us to look at more than somebody's ability to answer the question. I can't divulge exactly what you do in those stations, but, but there are a number of skills that we're testing, number of attitudes that we're testing, and it, it's a number of different people that carry out each of those stations. There is also going to be, it's something we've not yet developed, but we're developing it over the next couple of months, is there is going to be a, 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 a written aspect to that interview process as well. Um, and that enables us to look at some of the, 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 the attitudes and the way that people think. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Um, anything else? Yes, uh, a couple more. So okay. if there are semesters, where yeah. can I find my timetable dates? Right, <laughs> OK. So at, at the, before the course starts, um, we issue students with what we call an allocation rotor. And that allocation rotor tells them when their clinical weeks are, when their study block weeks are for the whole of the three years. And linked to that is um, an assessment timetable. So students can see when assessment components are being issued and they can see when assessments are due. So that enables the student to plan the whole of their, their, their three years out if they want to at the beginning. What it also shows is, is standard annual leave periods when students are on annual leave. And in addition to that, students get um, floating annual leave days that they can book to the times. Um, what it, it doesn't work through central university timetabling. So if students are in study blocks, then they have 26 hours of teaching that week and all study blocks run on a Monday from 10 o'clock till four o'clock, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from nine o'clock till four o'clock and on a Friday from nine o'clock till one o'clock. Yeah, so every study block timetable will be the same when it comes to the start and finish times. When students are in clinical placement, it's a little bit more complicated, but they attend for 30 hours a week and the clinical partners that we work with will inform the students of, of when that attendance is. Now that does vary from hospital to hospital, and it also varies from allocation to allocation within the hospital. But we, we, we talk a fair bit about that when we meet with our offer holders. OK, 
So that, I know that sounds slightly more complicated than, than a traditional university timetabling, but we make sure students have all that information in, in advance. Okay. Thank you for that question. We have a couple of minutes left, if you don't mind yes. answering two more questions. No, that's fine. I'll be as quick as I can. <laughs> okay. So um, the next one is, are there any COVID restrictions still? No. <laughs> in, in a word, there are no restrictions. What, what there are in theatres are slightly enhanced infection control procedures. Now, that's not where it was at the peak of COVID, but there are one or two things that are now done in theatres that are slightly enhanced beyond what we did before. There is no requirement for students to have COVID vaccinations, but we highly recommend it because that protects not only the student themselves, but it protects the vulnerable people that students are working with when they're in theatre. Um, there are no, there's no, um, none of the changes that we made for the to the programme during COVID still exist. We've, we've managed to turn everything back to the way that we worked pre-COVID. So there are no limitations to what our students can achieve. Thank you. That's great. So the final question is, is the clinical feedback all graded? Does it count um, in the final mark? Or right. I, I suppose right. they're asking, is there room for trial and error in the platform? Right, OK, right. So, so, OK. That, that's a good question. So the final mark or the final degree classification is calculated only from the academic component of the programme. Yeah. The, the clinical assessment, and I hope the way I'm going to say this makes sense, the clinical assessment has to be achieved at 100%. Yeah, because if students don't achieve it at 100 percent, they can't be an ODP. But I need to explain what I mean by that. So it's not graded. It's not marked. When I say it has to be achieved at 100 percent, it ba it's based on the achievement of clinical outcomes that describe what the role of the ODP is. So if we describe the role of the ODP, let's say in 10 outcomes, there's a lot more than that. But if we describe it in 10 outcomes, students have to achieve all of those outcomes to become an ODP, therefore the 100%. So that is graded on the university system as a pass fail component. So if students achieve all of the outcomes, they pass. If they don't achieve all of the outcomes, they fail. Yeah. Um, so I think that answers that question. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's all the time we have for questions. Okay. Definitely lots of information. Thank you yep. for a great talk. OK. And yeah, that's all the yep. time we have for questions today. Yep. If you want to say a final few words. Yeah, thank you very much for the people that have attended. Um, the only thing I would say is if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to email us at ODP Education. You know, we're here to answer those questions and we do understand firstly how complex the world of ODP is. We understand the choices that you as applicants are now making and we want to support you in making those choices. So thank you very much for your interest today. All the very best.